Um, so uh, it's nice to be with you uh, this evening, albeit in pixelated form. Um, and as James said, at the time when I was supposed to come and give you this talk in person, I was measured survey manager with Historic Environment Scotland. I am now retired from that post, but uh, it seemed an awful waste going through all my slides and removing HES uh, logos and things like that. So the talk is still branded um, as if I were a member of staff, but I am not trying to pose as such. So, um, yes, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is Romilly Allen's classification system for Pictish sculpture, class struggle, as Romilly Allen's classification system had its day. But a little bit about me, um, I have to be um, upfront with you and say I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an historian, I'm not an art historian, so I make no claim to any academic expertise whatsoever. I am, or I was, a surveyor of monuments. My expertise lies in measured survey. So vocational, not scholarly. Uh, the term measured survey might not be familiar to all of you, although I'm sure it is, because I, I kind of get the feeling that no SAS members go out and do their own measured surveys. Um, but it's the production of detailed, metrically accurate scale drawings, plans, elevations, and sections, all drawn on site. That was the standard MO for the Royal Commission and subsequently HES, we made our um, all of our surveys, all of the topics, all of the subjects on site. And in my time, I have recorded everything from Neolithic chambered cairns right the way up to the shuttered concrete, everything in between. Uh, stone circles, hut circles, broths, dunes, hill forts, cross houses, country houses, churches, abbeys, tower houses, you name it, I've surveyed it. I um, have a particular interest in recording carved stone, and uh, again that ranges from the prehistoric right the way through to medieval. Uh, Post-medieval, that's me on site at Craigievar Castle doing exactly what I said, measure, observe, and record. Um, but I have a particular interest in the medieval period. That was my main um, passion and what I latterly spent most of my time doing, which was rather nice. But, as, but my job over the years, I worked in survey for 36 years, it has afforded me two great advantages. The first being breadth of experience. Um, Whatever type of monument that we were surveying, I got to record lots and lots of them. And that was particularly the case with early medieval sculpture. I'm pretty certain I recorded well over a thousand pieces, maybe 1200 plus um, pieces of early medieval sculpture. It's um, a fantastic experience to have seen them all, uh, to have spent time observing them and recording them and to get to know them um, really quite intimately. Uh, so sheer numbers, great thing. And then, you know, you come to things like the relatively rare, relatively uncommon um, symbol, that notched rectangle and Z-rod. Um, there are only, well, I think there's a new one found, so we've probably got about uh, seven now uh, incised examples, and I've recorded them all. So you, you again, you get an intimate knowledge of um, uh, all of these things. The other great advantage um, that I had was time. Um, I, occasionally you come up against the clock for external reasons. I did once record uh, an old brewery and was parked outside, swinging there, ready to go to demolish the building as soon as we were finished. Um, but Occasions like that aside, um, I was afforded however much time I said I needed to record something. So this example here, this is the Pictish cross slab that stands in the garden of the former manse at Glam's in Angus. And I spent the best, almost an entire week recording that. Um, the morning sun fell on the other side, so I spent four mornings recording that, and this side got the afternoon sun, so I spent five afternoons 
measuring and drawing that. It stands at about well, 2.5 metres high, something like that. Eight, nine, yeah, not short, not much short of nine feet. So um, it was a big job, but it was great to just be afforded the time to get to grips with it and record it to my own satisfaction. Um, my involvement with recording early medieval sculpture goes back to the late 1980s and early 1990s um, with uh, working on these two um, landscape archaeology volumes published by the Royal Commission, Northeast and Southeast Persia. A couple of stones that fitted into that um, region. Um, and that was, these are my humble beginnings into um, the whole process of recording early medieval sculpture. But one nice thing that that survey also did was we were recording whole landscapes of um, sort of preserved settlement up in the in, in the uplands and in, in the, the upper um, reaches of the glens there, and um, in particular interest to us at the time were these sort of elongated buildings, um, which were very definitely not typical of Stone Age. Bronze Age or even Iron Age um, uh, structures. Um, so we recorded them in the landscape, we recorded them in detail, and um, we had the suspicion that they might actually be early medieval or Pictish. So my colleague, Strat Halliday, who was kind of in charge of the survey at the time, he coined the term Picarmic type house because that was one of the sites at Picarmic uh, where we had them. And being a pit name, he, he wanted to try and associate the Pictishness, potential Pictishness with it. And of course, they have subsequently been excavated and dated to 7th, 8th, 9th century. So bang on the money for um, Pictish settlement in, in Persia. Southeast Perth, um, we got to grips with Meagle, a very nice collection. Um, I, and that was my first real in-depth recording exercise. To be honest, that's now 30 years ago, I would really like to go back and do it again, but hey ho. Uh, and then in the mid 1990s, um, moving up into Aberdeenshire, um, a survey we called it the Strathdon survey. It was, it was re really the, the, the basin of the River Don, quite an um, uh, uh, undertaking, but included within that was a fantastic assemblage of Pictish and early medieval sculpture, mostly symbol stones, uh, 60 plus in the survey area and a handful of cross slabs, um, but an absolutely fantastic. And so by this time I was kind of getting my eye in and um, really getting to grips with the subject. Then in the early noughties, we were asked by Historic Scotland, uh, which was at that time, obviously, a, a separate organisation to go and record the St. Vigens um, assemblage in advance of a proposed redisplay of the stones in the wee museum there. So again, that was kind of fun, uh, very different, mostly cross slabs, um, some with symbols, some without, uh, lots of recumbents. Um, so again, just a really nice opportunity to spend as much time as was required to, to get to grips with this. And, and it was very nice because we we got to discover new things, a new Ogham inscription that had never been spotted before. We got to associate uh, fragments which had never been joined up before. Um, so uh, new symbols on stones, um, lots of nice new things coming out of the survey. And from that, it just built um, from the Strathdon area, we went on to record all of Aberdeenshire and then expanding out from uh, St. Vigens to go and record all of Angus and all of Caithness and all of Sutherland all of Murray, Venetshire, Nairnshire, East of Ross, Perthshire, all of Fife, and indeed up till my retirement there, much of the material south of the Forth and, Forth and Clyde. So um, it has been a fantastic um, experience. <coughs> Excuse me. And during that time, working away in all this material, Alan's classification system, it was just taken as read. Everybody used it, everybody referred to it, and so did I, without question. It was just um, the handiest thing to have to be able to 
say to people, oh, it's a class one, it's a class two, it's a class three, and um, that was no problem. And in fact, um, ECMS, the Early Christian Monuments of Scotland, Alan and Anderson's book, which was originally published in 1903, was republished by Pigfoot Press um, in paperback, making it um, very accessible. And I actually had two copies. It's a two volume book. I had two copies, uh, two volumes on the bookshelf at home and two volumes that lived in my car with me when I went away in field work and it was my go-to reference book. It still is in many ways. It's, a, it's still a very handy um, publication. Um, but everything that was in it was just taken without question, um, absolutely. Um, and if you're remotely interested in Pictish Stumpshire, remotely familiar with it, you'll probably be familiar with Alan's classification system. But let's just run through what it is. A class one stone are monuments with incised symbols. He doesn't specify, but he does mean Pictish symbols. And that's all they have. That's a class one stone. A class two stone uh, has monuments with but also a cross and Celtic form of ornament, so interlace or key pattern and that kind of thing, and it has to be carved in relief. So that's what constitutes class two. And then class three, uh, monuments with Celtic ornament, carved in relief, but without the symbols uh, of the other two classes. So it really is quite straightforward, um, and there didn't seem to be much cause to question it or um, uh, doubt it. Um, and it's referred to constantly by scholars, by anyone dealing or referring to Pictish sculpture. In fact, I think it's actually referred to quite glibly. Whenever a new stone is discovered, the press release goes out and the archaeologists or whoever will refer to it, oh, it's a class two Pictish stone, as if that somehow means something to Joe public, which I'm sure it probably doesn't. But it's a little bit sort of, it's almost a bit nerdy, but it's just used so frequently um, that it's, it's almost glib. Um, and within Alan's system, there is chronology, uh, and it's not just coincidental because he uses a numerical sequence of one, two, and three, which obviously has a chronology to it, but the, the, the chronological sequence is much more in, in intrinsically wrapped up in his system. Um, and in fact, Alan himself writes in the book, hence there arises the preliminary necessity to classify the stones so as to ascertain the typical characteristics and thus determine their probable sequence in time. So he's very definitely looking to come up with a chronology and not just um, a classification system in the way that you might do for botany or um, natural history or any other kind of science. Um, within this, there is, there is there's a sequential um, to his uh, classification system without doubt. Um, and it's hardwired in there um, because in the, in the early Christian monuments of Scotland, he ignores all the previous catalogues by other antiquarian scholars like Chalmers or Stuart, and he imposes his own numbering sequence for each of them. And in each case, for each site that has two or all three um, classes of stone at it, he pulls the class one stones to the four. If there are no class one, he pulls the class two stones to the four. Um, again, that's, that's quite a thing. The standard practice with other branches of science would be that the person first discovers, records something, then that becomes, a, like botany, if you're the person that goes out and finds a new plant, then your name that you that, that it's given to it is the one that comes first. Um, uh, Alan ignored that. He came up with his own number and sequence and pulled the class one and the class two stones to the four. So for a site like, there are actually very few sites that have all three classes of sculpture present, believe it or not. 
um, uh, but for one of them, one simple stone there, so it becomes Strathmartin 1. It might not have been the first stone found at the site, but Alan pulls it to the front and it becomes number one. Then we have a handful of class two stones across slabs with symbols, and they become two to six. That's number three illustrated there. And then we have a couple of class three stones with no symbols, and they bring up the rear, becoming um, Strathmartin seven and eight. Um, so very definitely, um, he is classifying the stones at this site, but he is also sequencing them um, in some kind of chronological order. Um, that's without a doubt. Um, and this pattern of numbering is repeated at Nagel, St. Vigens, Rosemarkey, and all the sites with more than one class of stone. Um, the class one stones first, then the class two, then the class three, reinforcing this inherent chronology. And that's my first problem with uh, his classification system is the chronology. In general terms, I think Alan is probably right. Um, his three classes probably do represent a general developmental sequence for Pictish sculpture, but only in general terms. And we should be very wary of thinking that every class one stone predates every class two, which in turn predates every class three. That is just a nonsense. It just isn't the way it works. I do not believe that. Um, uh, but it's very difficult to get away from that if we follow his book, if we follow his classification system. So we'll look at some recent work. Um, Gordon Noble excavated the Provincial Fort at Dunacare. He has a horizon of it being abandoned by about 390 AD. So although that he didn't find any sculpture in a context that could be dated, by association, the sort of um, formative sculpture stones and at least one half decent one fully formed, which were found down in the water below, it looks as if they were put into the wall around this promontory fort and retrieved from the, um, the sea uh, below the, the wall. Um, it looks very much as if these stones were carved and put in place by AD 390 at the latest, sometime before that perhaps. Um, so we've got Pictish symbols, proto symbols appearing from the late fourth century. Um, again, can't prove it, but excavation at Cowsey Cave, um, where we have again very simplistic, probably early Pictish symbols. Um, uh, we've got current 400 AD. And again, back to Gordon Noble at Rhiney, um, the palisaded enclosure there with the cross stain, the one on the left, uh, still in place. Uh, a socket for a second stone, perhaps Rhiney Man. Um, uh, the two stones flanking the entrance to this um, sort of uh, important uh, dwelling. And again, he has a horizon of that being burnt down and abandoned by about 580 AD. So, Symbol stones being erected by 580 at the latest, probably a bit earlier than that. Our historians rely as a, um, 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 inform us reliably that the, the Glam's Man Stone, which we saw earlier, they date that to the seventh century, 650, something like that, 675. Again, our historians will tell us that the Pictish symbol of the eagle is derived from, copied from, um, manuscript art, and we have a, it's a very, very um, strong parallel in the Northumbrian Gospels, which are dated by the, gospel, the um, manuscript experts to about 720 AD. So, symbol stones dating from the early 8th century. Again, art historians tell us that the Aberlemno uh, curtain stone dates to, again, the early 8th century. Here we have a, a class two stone with symbols. And um, so, you know, that's at the same time as this one. Aberlemno uh, roadside, that one with massive big symbols um, 
uh, reminiscent of the sort of giant symbols that we have up in Easter Ross. Um, that's dated to the probably early mid ninth century. Um, and then we have a class three stone albar, which the art historians date to the eighth class two um, and potentially even class one stones. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would also, um, again, I can't prove any of this, but my own personal feeling is that some of the, the, the more degraded examples of Pictish symbols like these two, uh, the one on the left for Inveraden and the one on the right from Fivey. Um, I, I would argue that these are late debased symbols carved when the whole tradition is on a downward train and the, um, the skilled artists who were familiar with the, the, the symbolic language have gone and we've got lesser Lesser men making lesser carvings for less discerning patrons. And um, that would be my take on things like this. So I don't know about hazard and I guess at that, but potentially into the, the ninth century, something like that, who knows? So we can see that Pictish symbols of a very long shelf life potentially from the late fourth up to the mid ninth century. Um, and yet within that period, we have class three stones with no symbols being carved. So there's clearly a great deal of overlap in the classes. And I think it's entirely possible that somewhere in Pictland um, in the eighth or the early ninth century, in three different parts of Pictland, there was somebody creating one of each class of monument. I think that's entirely um, possible. Uh, and in fact, that the one thing um, that strikes me, being, being part of a, an organization like a public um, sector organization. I was always required to work in, couldn't just go randomly and say I'm, I'm going to go out and record all this. It always had to be in <clears throat> manageable blocks and my senior managers always liked county uh, blocks. So you know you would make a case depending on what size of the assemblage to record. Caithness could be done in a year, Aberdeenshire took several years, that kind of thing. And you kind of think to yourself that a county boundary, well, that's a modern thing. It has nothing to do with, and it's, it's kind of daft that you're going to be rubbing up against um, the neighbouring county where it will be just much the same, but you can't go into that because you're restricted. But actually, having worked on a county by county basis, the regional assemblages of Pictish early medieval sculpture differs massively from county to county and sometimes within one part of a county to another. The, the assemblage along the River Don is totally different from that along the River Dee and they are just separated by, you know, 20 miles, 15 miles, something like that. But it's a totally different um, thing. So different things happening uh, in different parts of picked land, not necessarily at different times, I think more likely to be at the same time, a different uh, take up of a Christian tradition or whatever. So um, uh, very definitely a huge amount of overlap um, in there. Um, the Allen system with its inherent and imposed chronology is in danger of making us blink to our likelihood. Um, and I think a good classification system should not come with such bias. And coincidentally, Allen's numbering system is most definitely not number proof. If we were found an incised symbol stone at Meagle, it would have to be, if we were sticking to his system, Meagle number one. And then Meagle, the current Meagle one, which is a class two stone, would have to become number two. And number two currently would be number three and so on. And you could end up in this constant and perpetual revision. It's a system devised for the moment and it has no... Um, uh, flexibility to deal with a changing um, uh, national assemblage. And as we know, these things are popping up out of the ground pretty much on a yearly basis. Um, so any classification system uh, defines the characteristics of each class and examines the material and then allocates each specimen accordingly. Um, Alan does just that according to his parameters. Class one, incised symbols only. Class two, symbols across and Celtic ornament, carved in relief. 
plus three, Celtic ornament carved in relief with a cross, but without symbols. All very straightforward. And so we get our, our little um, piece of paper on our clipboard, and we check the sculpture against this list of features. Symbols tick, cross tick, ornament tick, carved relief tick, bingo, it's a class two stone. And so we run through them. And I think this is the point I was probably making um, when uh, in the uh, Elgin Cathedral, James, when, when we met there um, with that particular class two uh, stone. Aberlemno Kirkyard, class two. Lamps Mans, class two. Dice, Mori Musk, very simple, paired back, almost like an incised symbol stone. The cross is kind of false relief, but it ticks all of these boxes. It's a class two. Golf speed, totally different game. Uh, incised symbols on the back, very ornate um, cross side and narrow edges with all, all that ornament. Carbon relief, again, class two. Maiden stone, class two. Lady Fairness, class two. And even a very own and brand new corn stone ticks all the boxes, it's a class two. No argument. But let's just look at these again. Upper Lendl. Look closely at it. Yes, this one is also pigmented like the first one, but make up the content, the style of carving, totally, totally different. Totally different. Again, dice um, in the way that it's carved and the way it's presented and laid out uh, in its ornament and content. Money Musk, as I say, totally paired back. Gospy, full of ornament, very busy. Maiden stone, monumentally big, now in a, a dire state, but the, the cross face has had some sumptuous um, uh, ornament on it. And, Fabulous ornament on the narrow sides, um, looking like a carpet page from a um, and then our, our corn stone with those unique big biting monsters and, and the likes. They are all totally, totally different. But, and that's my problem with my second problem um, with Alan's system is this a pro forma blindness. Whilst we're busy ticking off our checklist of components, I think we're in danger of becoming blind to what we're actually looking at. We're focusing all our attention on common denominators and we're becoming inured to the individuality and distinctiveness of the monuments. Um, and I, I, I think that's a very common thing where people go, oh yeah, yeah, it's just another class one, that's just another class two. And there's this temptation to just not look at the thing individually. Um, and I think that, affects us on all three uh, classes of, of the system. That's a kind of blindness. Um, and an example of that um, is that also that the system doesn't really allow for any nuanced interpretation. Uh, this is the Aleph stone. It's one of the very first ones that I recorded. And it has an incised symbol in the back. It has a relief card cross with ornament on the front. Um, so it ticks all the boxes. It's a class two stone and Alan describes it as such. But I'm not really convinced that it represents a design that was from the outset meant to look like this, front and back. I think it's at least possible, if not probable, that it starts off life as an incised symbol stone, and then someone adds this cross with the ornament, because the cross and the ornament are actually very, very different from most things that we get elsewhere in Pictland. Um, so I don't think this is a typical class two stone. Um, and again, we then get into these philosophical arguments. If we have, does it only require the presence of the particular components to meet the classification? I would argue no, because I would say that a typical class two stone that combines all of these components does so for a purpose to convey a message or messages. So just as a, an example, and I'm not, I'm not 
saying this is what I think this means. But just for an example, if this was carved in one period as a class two stone, then the message it might say is that Fred, represented by the symbol, is a Pict. And Fred the Pict is a Christian represented by the cross. That might be what a class two stone says um, of its patron or the person that commemorates. But if Fred the Pict carved his moniker or had his moniker carved for him on a stone, and then somebody subsequently puts a cross on the front for a different reason, that might not then convey that Fred the Pict was a Christian. That might be somebody saying, this stone is Christian. I don't know what this is all about. So it's a philosophical nuance, but I would argue that this, if there's room for doubt, that this is part of a, a consistent one period design, then I don't think it would typically qualify for being um, a class two stone, but the system doesn't allow for nuance. It's just tick box. It's got this, that, and the other, bang. It goes into the class two filing cabinet. Um, yeah, so that's why I think it starts off as a simple stone and then a cross is added. Class three is defined, is defined by the presence of a cross and Celtic ornament, carbon relief, but an absence of Pictish symbols. That sounds quite straightforward. And so, yeah, we can look at all bar, we've got the cross, we've got the ornament, we've got all the figurative carving, it's all carbon relief, but we ain't got no Pictish symbols, so very definitely a class three stone. But Alan also puts this in his book, the Grief Cross Lab, as a class three stone, because there are no symbols on it. And he puts this little fragment from St. Vigens into the class three department because there are no symbols on it. But we don't know what's been removed from the back of the Creef Cross Lab. It has been almost certainly deliberately defaced at some point. Um, and we don't in picked land and looking at the other, the rest of the ornament on it, there's a, I would say a 50-50 chance that it had symbols on the back. And the same goes with this one. We don't know what's missing from this, what was um, filling this space. It could very easily have been symbols. And that's the old adage, absence of evidence is no evidence of absence. And so that's my problem. My next problem um, uh, with this is just this poor definition. If we, if we very simplistically defined a chicken as a creature with feathers and a beak. And what are we going to make of this? Because it ain't got no feathers and it ain't have a beak. Um, there needs to be something a bit more um, uh, to be able to cope with something in an altered state, um, without a doubt. So, you know, we really have to say that we don't know what classification this is, it's two slash three, even three. Alan made that mistake in allocating a classification, a, a class to a, a fragment, and that's been continued down the line um, with stones found since his time. If a small fragment is found and there is no um, element of a symbol on it, it gets put into a class three, um, and we really shouldn't be doing that. Um, so Alan's classification system um, hinges on the presence and absence of Pictish symbols. If they're present on their own and incised, it's one. If they're present in association with other imagery, carbon relief, typically a cross, then it's class two. And then if they're totally absent, then it becomes class three. Um, so as such, this could be seen as a system relevant solely to Pictish sculpture because it's all about the presence or absence of a Pictish component. But ECMS covers all of Scotland, and thus includes Dalriadic, Brythonic, Anglo-Saxon, and North Sculpture. And Alan duly applies his classification system to all of the above. St John's Cross and Iona, it goes into class three. Stone from Govan 
goes into class three. Stone from Barra, north one, goes into class three. So everything really that's out with Pickland, by and large, gets lumped together in class three, along with the other stones in Pickland that fulfill the criteria for class three. It becomes um, a bit of a dumping ground. And, you know, can we really categorise a stone by the absence of a particular cultural component when that stone comes from out with that culture? I would argue again that we can't. That's an inherent weakness in a system. Um, for Pictish sculpture, class three is entirely valid, but for non-Pictish sculpture, it's just a dumping ground. And I don't think that's a particularly useful um, thing. Um, the study of early medieval sculpture isn't a science, but the whole point of making accurate records and of devising this classification system is surely to bring an element of scientific rigor to the subject. And in fact, we can quote Alan on that thing. It has been proposed that an attempt be made to deal scientifically with the sculptured stones of Scotland. That's, that's the introduction to the book. So he is trying to bring um, a certain rigor to the process um, and not just make it, you know, all arty farty, um, but I think, frankly, he fails. Um, and it's like I say, I think I, 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 to have a classification that ends up being a dumping ground for all the all of the non Pictish material that included in the book. I think it's um, unsatisfactory. It's also um, to be noted that he, he picks up on a few simple crosses um, in Aberdeenshire Large and he misses them all out and um, not really particularly interested in them. Um, so, not maybe about 20 years ago, something like that, Isabel Henderson proposed that uh, this particular type of sculpture, the simple cross, should be seen as a class four. Um, now, she has since sort of rolled back from that, um, uh, but her proposing it, I think they wanted to draw attention to an important but an almost entirely overlooked part of the story. And it, the case for that is so evident um, on D side, as I mentioned earlier, um, the River Don stuffed to the gunnels with Pictish symbol stones. The River D, just a few miles to the south, run in parallel, pretty much the same length, a catchment area, broadly similar, but you only have a handful of Pictish sculptures along the entire length of the D. The what you do have in spades are these sil um, simple crosses running along there. Um, Contemporary with uh, part, but by and large overlooked um, because it didn't fulfill his criteria because there were, was no ornament. And I think by omitting these simple crosses from his study and denying them a place uh, in his system, uh, he misses out a key component uh, in the record and study of early medieval sculpture in Scotland. And it's an oversight that perpetuated for much of the 20th century, um, hence um, Isabel Henderson's sort of uh, attempt to bring them into a, a sharper focus um, about 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so, to conclude, what system would I put in place of Allen's? Well, we could limit the application of his system solely to Pictish sculpture, and that would deal with some of the issues that I have with it. Don't refer to St John's Cross or any of the Brythonic or Anglo-Saxon or Norse sculpture um, out, uh, as part of this. Just take it solely for Pictish sculpture. But even that has its problems, because what exactly constitutes Pictland? By the late 9th and certainly the 10th century, Pictland isn't really Pictland anymore and some scholars start referring to Picto-Scottish sculpture. So it then becomes a moot point as to whether something that's Picto-Scottish would qualify to be part of a classification system solely for Pictish sculpture. It becomes problematic in that. So I don't think that is the answer. 
And the truth is, I don't have an answer to it. Um, I don't have a brain big enough. I'm not that scholarly. I just know that I have a growing dissatisfaction with Alan's system. And I think the scholarly world needs to either put its mind together and come up with something better, or at the very least, stop perpetuating um, something that is deeply flawed. Thank you very much.